Up until now, we have covered message passing algorithms on probabilistic graphical models, which has found many use cases, such as error correcting codes and time series modeling. However, in modern times where we have access to petabytes of data in domains where we don't have a lot of good prior knowledge, then these algorithms may not be sufficient for modeling complex patterns in data that is demanded today. In this final chapter, we will look at some modern developments in modeling data on graphs based on deep learning. This is encompassed in this framework referred to as message passing neural network, and we will look at some commonly used models that fall within this class, as well as compare with the traditional message passing algorithms based on probabilistic graphical models. Machine learning has seen a massive transformation in the past decade, largely due to the prominence of neural networks for modeling large, complex data. Their success can be attributed to several reasons, including the extreme flexibility for modeling arbitrary functions, summarized in the famous universal approximation theorem, their ability to process complex data structures such as images, languages, and audio slash videos, the fact that they're actually quite simple in the sense that they're composed of simple parallelizable components such as matrix multiplication that can be processed extremely efficiently using modern hardwares such as GPUs and TPUs, and lastly, the development of automatic differentiation in addition to frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch that implements this. Well, I'm sure I don't need to introduce this. Here's the basic architecture of the multilayer perceptron, which consists of an input layer, an output layer, and hidden layers between, where they're formed by taking an affine map of the previous layer, superseded by applying pointwise nonlinearity, in particular the rectified linear unit, which is the most commonly used one. This is composed multiple times to yield increasingly complex models. For classification tasks, we perform logistic regression in the final layer, where the outputs are formed by applying the softmax function on an affine transformation of the final layer. This implies that the final hidden layer corresponds to the features used for classification, and one may think of each layer as hierarchically extracting features of the data that can be useful for classification. While the multilayer perceptron does not assume any structure on the input data, many data that we encounter in the wild have some relational information encoded in the form of graphs. For example, this includes molecules, where the set of atoms and bonds can be modeled trivially as graphs. We also have social networks, citation networks, and traffic networks, where the roads can be modeled as edges on a graph connecting different places. Let's consider an example and see how this relational information can be important when performing a machine learning task. We take the Quora dataset, which is a citation network consisting of 2,708 machine learning publications, and 5,429 citation links between articles, which can be modeled as nodes and edges respectively on a graph. In addition, each node consists of a vector of size 1,433, which corresponds to a bag of words representation of keywords in each article. And the articles are separated into seven classes corresponding to the topic such as neural networks and probabilistic methods. The task of this dataset is to classify the nodes according to the seven classes. Let's see how we will go about fulfilling this task using the multilayer perceptron. The most trivial way to solve this task is to perform MLP classification with node features as inputs to the model, which we recall corresponds to the keywords in the article, and the seven topics as the outputs. Now, this approach is clearly limited, as it ignores any relational information between the nodes, which is most likely going to help since two articles that are connected by a citation is likely to be on the same topic. In addition, with only around 2,700 articles in total, this is prone to overfitting without having any inductive bias. We can also consider the use of belief propagation to solve this task, where we model the citation network as a marker random field with pairwise potential, which we take as follows, where we assign the value 0.9 when two neighboring nodes are of the same class, and 0.0166 otherwise, where this number was simply chosen so that each row and column of the potential sum to one. We can then perform loopy belief propagation on this graph to compute the marginal probability of unobserved nodes given the observed nodes. While this method explicitly takes into account the relational information, unlike the previous approach, it does not consider node features, which can be useful. In addition, the choice of the pairwise potential is mostly heuristic and may not accurately reflect the actual relation between neighboring nodes. With this, we ask whether we can develop a model that can combine the benefits of both approaches, where we inherit the flexibility of neural networks, in addition to explicitly accounting for the relational information between nodes as done using belief propagation.
To begin our discussion on how to develop neural networks that deal with graph inputs, we first look at the convolutional neural network architecture, which is a historically important model for putting machine learning in the limelight. Unlike the multilayer perceptron, CNNs incorporate an inductive bias for inputs defined on grids, such as images. In particular, the model is robust to translations of images, which increases its ability to generalize beyond the distribution of the training set. CNNs also construct features from local patches of images instead of the whole image, leading to sparse connectivity between nodes in the corresponding computational graph, resulting in increased efficiency and scalability. It also has shared weights, which result in way fewer parameters compared to MLP. Now, we know that CNNs are the de facto model for processing grid inputs and has found phenomenal success in computer vision. We also saw that grids are in fact a type of graphs, so naturally it makes sense to learn from the success of CNNs to generalize the architecture to arbitrary graph inputs. From this, we extract the criteria for an ideal neural network model defined on graphs that inherit the benefits of CNNs. The first property we would like to have is computational and storage efficiency, ideally linear in the number of nodes and edges. In CNNs, this is satisfied because the convolution operator has linear cost and image size. And likewise, storing the feature maps also cost linearly in image size. Next is a property that the parameter size is independent of the input size, which is clearly satisfied by CNNs since the filter size is independent of the image size. We would also like to have the property that it uses only local information to hierarchically construct features, which makes the resulting computational graph sparse. And lastly, we would also want to use edge features if it exists in the dataset, in addition to node features, to make more informed predictions. Now, this property does not exist in CNNs, but would still be useful to have in order to deal with general graph inputs. One way to achieve this goal is to try to extend what we mean by a convolution on a general graph. As the name suggests, CNNs are based on the convolution operator, which is given as follows. Where discretizing it gives us the familiar formula for convolution C and CNNs, where the psi's correspond to the filters and f corresponds to the input image or hidden features. By construction, we see that this way of defining and discretizing convolutions only applies to grid inputs and it is not so obvious how we can extend this notion to graph inputs. For example, in standard convolutions, we can afford to have filters of fixed size regardless of the inputs, since on a grid graph, the adjacency structure is the same at each node. While on a general graph, each node can have different numbers of neighbors, making it problematic to have filter size that is uniform across the input space. To overcome this problem, the Eichler paper by John Brunner and others, which is one of the formative papers on graph neural nets, addressed this by adopting an alternative viewpoint of convolutions in Fourier space. In particular, a standard result in Fourier analysis tells us that convolution in physical space corresponds to pointwise multiplication in Fourier space. That is, the Fourier transform of the convolution between f and psi in the physical space is equivalent to pointwise multiplication of the Fourier transform of f and the Fourier transform of psi. The nice thing about this viewpoint is that we can now generalize this notion of convolutions to graphs easily, since the notion of Fourier transforms exists on arbitrary graphs. This is done by following the following three steps, where the first is to construct the so-called graph Laplacian, which is defined by subtracting the adjacency matrix from the degree matrix. Then we diagonalize this matrix to get the change of basis matrix U, which consists of the eigenvectors of L, and the diagonal matrix lambda, which consists of the eigenvalues of L. Finally, we can define the Fourier transform of F as a change of basis with respect to U, defined as U transpose times F. And likewise, we can define the inverse Fourier transform of F hat, which is defined by U times F hat. Now, with these definitions, we can define convolutions on graphs easily by plugging in these expressions for the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform here, giving us the spectral graph convolution operator. Now this leads us to our first graph neural network architecture, which simply replaces the convolution layer in CNNs with a spectral graph convolution, giving us the spectral net model. In practice, 
Instead of parameterizing the filter psi in the physical space, it is common to parameterize it in Fourier space to avoid having to compute the expensive Fourier transform on the filter every time. Furthermore, a so-called diagonal parameterization is typically used where we model each component of the vector psi hat as a trainable parameter. Now, let's go back to our original criteria for our ideal graph neural network and see how the spectral net performs in each criterion. In terms of the efficiency of spectral net, this is quadratic in the number of nodes for both compute and storage. This is due to the expensive Fourier transform, requiring us to store the change of basis matrix U and the necessity to perform dense matrix vector multiplication, which costs quadratically in the size of nodes. Hence, spectral net does not do so well in this department. Regarding the parameter size, this is equal to the order of the graph, since we parameterized each component of the Fourier transform filter, which is a vector of size equal to the number of nodes. Hence, it does poorly here too, as the parameter size scales linearly with the graph size. Regarding the next point, the diagonal parameterization that was employed turns out to be non-local in the sense that each node in the hidden layer is sensitive to changes in the non-neighboring nodes in the previous layer, which violates this point too. Finally, while the information regarding the adjacency structure of the graph is indirectly supported by the Fourier transform, nowhere in this architecture does it allow us to include explicit edge features, such as distance between nodes. Hence, it fails in this department too. In conclusion, the spectral net, while an elegant idea, is far from our ideal graph neural network model, and some work must be done to address these issues. Alternatively, we can consider a spatial approach to graph convolution more akin to the standard convolution operation in CNNs. The work by David Duvenod and others proposed the following model, where the hidden feature at node i and layer L plus 1 is formed by aggregating a transformation of the neighboring hidden features in the previous layer L by a learnable weight matrix W that depends on the degree at node i. Here we assume that the graph includes self-connections so that the node i is neighbors with itself. The reason for allocating different weight matrices for neighbors of different sizes is to prevent importance always being attached to nodes with high connectivity. For instance, if the weight matrices were the same across all nodes, then since we are summing over all the neighbors, there will naturally be a tendency to have more contributions from nodes with simply more neighbors instead of its actual importance. The downside to this parameterization is that since we need to have different weight matrices for different node degrees, we will soon run into memory issues. To prevent this, Kip and Welling proposed the following solution, where this dependency on the node degree is encoded by simply scaling a fixed weight matrix by the square root of the degree of the node i in addition to the square root of the degree at node j. This simple approach has been found to perform quite well in many problems and have since become the graph neural network, earning the name graph convolutional network. From a theoretical perspective, the simple scaling can be motivated by the fact that it can be derived as a special case of the Chebnet architecture, which is a localized variant of the spectral network architecture that we saw earlier. Now, let's see how a good graph convolutional network is based on our four criterion. In terms of the computational cost, this scales linearly in the number of nodes where the most significant cost comes from this vector matrix multiplication performed v times, which has cost cf, where c is the size of vector h, and w is a matrix of size cf. On the other hand, the most significant memory overhead comes from the need to store the adjacency matrix A, which represented as a sparse matrix, requires memory that is only linear in the total number of edges. Hence, the GCN architecture passes the efficiency test. In terms of the parameter size, this is only of the order CF per layer required to store the weight matrix W. Since the scaling is independent of the input graph size, it passes here too. Now, by construction of the model, we also know that the hidden features at each node are constructed only from its neighbors in the previous layer, hence it satisfies the locality test. However, as with the spectral net architecture, the vanilla formulation of the GCN architecture does not take into consideration explicit edge features, so it does not pass the final test. We see that in practice, the GCN architecture is significantly more practical 
compared to the spectral architecture, and is hence close to our ideal graph neural network model. The only downside is that it does not take into account edge features, which we will address next in the message passing framework. Before we go into message passing neural networks, let's first consider an example where the GCN architecture is particularly useful, which is in semi-supervised learning. This is a setting that applies when the number of labeled data points are small, but relations between labeled and unlabeled data exist so that we can infer the property of unlabeled data through this relation. For example, in this diagram, we have the labeled data represented as shaded nodes and unlabeled data represented as unshaded nodes, and there exist relations between them in the form of a graph. We go back to our previous example using the Cora dataset and use only 140 nodes for training and 1,000 nodes for testing. The training and test data are related via the underlying graph structure of the citation network. By training a GCM model with a cross-entropy loss over the labeled data, Kipf and Welling reports the accuracy of a staggering 81.5% using the graph convolutional network, compared to 55.1% using a vanilla multi-layer perceptron, clearly highlighting the importance of taking into account the relational information between nodes in the graph. Message passing neural networks, originally proposed in this ICML paper by Justin Gilmer and others, was originally developed in the course of predicting quantum properties of molecules. This framework has since gained widespread traction as a general framework for learning features on graphs, able to handle both node and edge features as inputs. This architecture is structurally similar to the message passing protocol we saw in belief propagation, which consists of two steps, where the message update step aggregates information from all the neighbors to node J that is to be sent to node i, and in the state update step, all the incoming messages are aggregated to update the information on node i. Likewise, message passing neural network consists of a message update step, a state update step, and an additional readout step, which maps the final hidden layer to the output layer of the model. The diagram on the right illustrates the structure of the message passing neural network, which is a deep neural network where each layer is a graph instead of a vector like in multi-layer perceptron. To see how message passing works, we look at how to update this node in the middle layer. The first step is to send messages from all its neighbors in the previous layer, where the message itself is modeled using a neural network that takes as inputs the hidden states at the source and target nodes, in addition to the edge features if available. The second step is to compute the state update to yield the hidden state at this node, where the update rule is again modeled using a neural network with inputs given by the previous state and an aggregation of all the messages sent to this node. The square symbol here is a placeholder for any operation that is permutation invariant, such as taking the sum, product, or mean. We update the states of the remaining nodes using the same process until we reach the final layer where we perform a readout step that maps it to the output states, again using a neural network. The readout can take many form depending on the task that is being considered. For example, one might have a node-wise classification task where we wish to predict the property of each node in the graph, in which case the readout function will output another graph in the same way as how we outputted graphs in the hidden layers using the message passing steps. We might also have a global classification task where the goal is to predict the property of the graph itself for example, predicting some properties of a molecule, in which case the readout step will simply aggregate the features in the final hidden state to output a single vector quantity. An important aspect of message passing neural networks is that it can be considered as an overarching framework for modeling data on graphs that is general enough to handle any peculiarities demanded by a given data set. In fact, as we will see next, most existing graph neural network architectures, in addition to some models that that are not traditionally seen as graph neural networks can be expressed as message passing neural networks by choosing specific architectures for the message and update networks. Our first example is the graph convolutional network, which we recall has the following relation between consecutive layers, where we assume that the underlying graph is self-connected 
so that each node i is connected to itself. Now, convince yourself that this is equivalent to a message passing neural network with the following message and update rules. Next, we look at the following message passing neural network architecture adopted by Gilmer et al's original work that was tailored to predict 13 quantum properties of molecules in the QM9 benchmark dataset. Now, this is a tricky dataset consisting of both node and edge features, such as atom type and bond type, and has been difficult to model even using advanced deep learning approaches. By modeling the message function as a linear transformation of the source feature H, where the transformation matrix depends on the edge features through a small MLP, and taking the update function to be a gated recurrent unit with inputs given by the sum of all incoming messages, Gilmer and others were able to achieve unprecedented accuracy on this data set, reaching the so-called chemical accuracy on 11 out of 13 tasks. As this shows, the framework provided by message passing neural networks enable us to model and think about message and state updates separately, which is useful for constructing new graph network models that is tailored to a given problem. Finally, we also show that even the transformer model, which has taken the machine learning world by storm in recent years, can be expressed as a message passing neural network. While I will not discuss the details of the transformer architecture here, one can show that the basic architecture is equivalent to a message passing neural network, where the message function corresponds to multi-head attention, which yields the attention weights and the value vectors. And the update function is given by a multi-layer perceptron sandwiched by layer normalizations. The aggregation function, in this case, corresponds to the sum of the value vectors weighted by the attention weights, and the underlying graph structure of the inputs is assumed to be fully connected. Now, graphically, the transformer model is shown in the right diagram, where we can clearly see the split between the message update steps, represented by the inner box, and the state update steps, which is represented by the outer box. I recommend reading the following blog post for more details on the connections between message passing neural networks and transformers. Let us now compare the message passing neural network with a loopy belief propagation algorithm, which are both structurally similar and deal with graph inputs. To begin, loopy belief propagation is a fundamentally Bayesian procedure where coupling between neighbors arise from prior knowledge of the model and the message passing rule follows directly from the laws of probability. On the other hand, message passing neural networks are frequentist, where the message and state update rules are learned and calibrated to the given data set to yield useful feature representations. Each approach therefore inherits the pros and cons of the Bayesian or frequentist paradigm. For example, the Bayesian paradigm can quantify uncertainty naturally, whereas the frequentist approach can be applied to a wide set of problems where no prior knowledge exists in the data. Next, both methods have a hierarchical or layered character, which is presented in the form of iterations in loopy belief propagation, where the states are updated iteratively to obtain better estimates of marginals, and depth in the case of message passing neural networks, which leverage the power of deep learning to extract increasingly complex features. Finally, we note that in loopy belief propagation, the prior assumptions used to model interactions between nodes are usually quite simple, often using only relational information. The simplicity also makes the predictions interpretable, which can be desirable in situations where the stakes are high. On the other hand, for message passing neural networks, while they are not interpretable, they have the ability to easily process node and edge features in addition to the relational information given by the graph in order to model complex relations in datasets that a simple prior model using LBP cannot. There are many interesting works in recent years that aim to combine the benefits of both approaches to cover up for one another's weakness, for example, by increasing the interpretability of message passing neural networks or including a learnable component in PGMs to make it more flexible. You can have a look at some of these works in the references provided. We end by providing references to the works that were mentioned in this chapter, where you can find more details beyond what is presented here. Thank you for listening to my lecture, and hope to see you all soon.